When the COVID lockdown hit in 2020, many families struggled. For Darren, work as a scaffolder dried up and he turned to stealing scrap metal to make money. But he paid the ultimate price, suffering life-changing third-degree burns. This is his story. And a warning, it does have pictures and a description of his injuries. Darren, thanks so much for coming to talk to us today. Really appreciate it and it's really good to see you. Um, before we get into the story about what happened to you 18 months ago, can we talk a bit about your life before 2020, your school apprenticeship, you became a scaffolder. Can you yeah, tell me about right. that? Yeah, basically in high school, um, I was in construction and then I went off to uh, do a plastering course around two years. And then halfway through, the, just about 18 months, two years, Mark, I went, I changed my trade from plastering yeah. to scaffolding. Um, and then become, I'd done a six month training course and then engaged with a part one and then yeah. a part two. Uh, I was a fully qualified scaffolder. Um, and basically that's um, what brought me up to the, obviously being a, a scaffolder. And then 2020 comes and lockdown comes. Yeah. And work slowed down for you. Yeah. What, what happened? Did you get furlough from the government? What, what happened with your financial uh, circumstances? Basically, my financial struggles were um, I wasn't up to date with my tax returns. Right. Um, so I didn't get any help with a, a self-employment grant or get any furlough. So right. I was basically throughout the lockdown period, I was struggling financially for funds. Um, yeah. All the building sites and everything was shut. Yeah. So I wasn't able to even find work, let alone commence any work. So I was just really in a struggle with it. Let's talk about what happened. You said previously that as a younger man in the past, you had broken the law here and there. Yeah, um, basically. But you left that behind, right? Yeah, so obviously in my younger days when I was struggling for money, I used to help myself to a bit of scrap out of old abandoned buildings, like places that were getting demolished and ready for demolition. Mm. So I wasn't like harming anybody. I wasn't doing anything majorly wrong in my mind. Just explain to us, what, it, what is scrapping? Because some people won't um, know what you're basically, doing around. Basically, if you've got an old abandoned building that's getting pulled down and demolitioned, de demolished, say. Yeah. Um, obviously, when I've been on the building sites before, the site agent said to me, I said, oh, there's a load of lead around there. If you want to help yourself, trick, it's only going to go in the okay. recycling side. So that's where I sort of picked it up from being a worker. Yeah. Being granted access to scrap from the site that was working on by the site manager. So sort of they sort of introduced me into it by saying, oh, help yourself to this, yeah. because other people are doing it. So obviously I picked that up. It's something I shouldn't have picked up, but obviously I picked it up and when November 2020, when I had my initial accident, I made a bad judgment of error. So do you got, had you, just before we go into that, had you got in trouble with the police about that in the past when you were a younger man? Then? Uh, I had Sorry. one or two times where I got in a little bit of trouble. And then it. you stopped doing it. Yeah, what, I carried on with working. You trained and, as a scaffolder. I maintained my career. Lockdown happens. And then I your just... Your dog's ill. Yeah, I just... You're desperate for cash. Yeah, so I had no sort of choice in order to go back to that sort of line mm. of work. And, um, and, and tell us what happened that night. What happened to you? Um, basically, I was in um, an old abandoned place, I believe. It's some sort of steelworks, I believe. Mm. Um, and I was doing what I was doing, collecting what I could find, sort of off the ground and stuff like that. And then um, there was like a bit of an electrical control room. Um, and obviously I've seen the doors wide open and stuff, so I just had a bit of a nose there. And then there was like copper bars inside the actual machine. But because of the way the land was situated, all being like disused and the fence and everything was open and anyone who could just walk on and off there, I just presumed it was off because I didn't right. see no lights, I didn't hear no noises, yeah. uh, the doors were wide open, so it's just like, just I don't know, it's just I just presumed it was off and I could sort of help myself to obviously a bit of extra cash. Yeah. Um, and within a blink of an eye, I felt my body lock up like an initial, like, I don't know, I can't, I can't find the words to explain it, but then I basically switched off like, I don't remember anything else apart from obviously dying. I believe I was dead for around two minutes, so maybe a short period of time. But obviously all of a sudden, I've just woke up and then started running for my life. And I hear him... So you're I'm, on fire? Yeah, full on on fire. So all my stomach, all my clothes, I had three layers of clothing on. So after the arc flash um, explosion, all my clothes was on fire. But at this time of being in the, the room, I don't remember 
I don't, it was just like, I, I remember vaguely watching my funeral take place as daft as it sounds. Some people don't believe me, but I, it's what I remember. Um, so obviously I've run out for my life. Um, I'm on fire. I've, I've obviously with the adrenaline, I was able to run faster than the two other lads. So I should have stopped really and let them put me out. But obviously I was more concerned about getting to the main road for safety. So I got to the main road um, and as my friend was on the phone to the ambulance service, he said I had about 26 minute wait time. Um, and I'd literally uh, within seconds of him being on the phone, an ambulance was passing with the blue lights on. Mm. Um, and I've ran from the car park bit where I was, in obviously in a bad way, um, and to put myself in front of the ambulance. And Darren, you, you went to hospital, you went to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital yes. in Birmingham. Um, what happened there? Can, I think we have some photos actually, which you're okay if we share, aren't you? That's um, around December. I believe, um, and I've, obviously afterwards, I got a disease called folliculitis dervicans, where I lost more hair than mm -hmm. that. So as you can see, I've had my full face completely mm -hmm. ripped off and redone off the skin off my legs. Uh, I think the only bit of normal skin that I managed to keep was probably four or five inches on the mm -hmm. back of my neck. So everything from that point here, mm -hmm. all the way around my neck, my face and obviously arms up to the shoulder and all my stomach was completely wrapped in that BTM material. From that image there to you today, you look remarkably well. Yeah, I've Is come it... a long way. Yeah. And a lot of people have said to me, they said, I see burn survivors struggling for two, three years and the face looks like disfigured and morphed. And obviously I don't think I'm that bad considering. It's just obviously what I'm missing is the features that make a face. So the eyebrows, the tip of the nose, the ears, and obviously the hairline. They're the main things that build a face and I've lost every single one of them. Mm. And just in terms of you're in hospital, you woke up, you were in a in coma for, for 23 days. 27 days. 27 days. When you were scrapping, you obviously didn't realise the implications of what could happen. No, well, obviously, to I, you. I just I wasn't fully aware of the dangers, um, and like I said, obviously the doors were open on the room that I entered. Um, so it's just it was just a major bad judgment of error all round. What yeah. happened with you or with the police or nothing? Um, the West Midlands uh, uh, Police Service they sent police officers to me address where I was living in Manchester at the time. Where, where I used to live with my mum, and the, I was out at the mall at the time, but they asked if I've had life-changing injuries. Mm. <clears throat> so, obviously, the mum explained to him, said, yeah, he has, he's had all this done to him, mm. that done to him. So, obviously, in my sort of mind, I've, I've had my punishment, in a sense, now. I've got the rest of my life to live with it. It must be extremely mentally difficult for you. What keeps you, go what keeps you going? Um, what keeps me going, I'd probably narrow it down to be, I've been blessed with a second chance at life because I believe for someone to have, like it's a miracle to survive it so what's the story behind that miracle for mm -hmm. surviving such a significant injury because like I said I've had the worst possible injury the human body could possibly withstand I've suffered being electrocuted and I've had an arc flash blast sent me catapulting across the room um, I've suffered uh, a lot of inhalation damage due to the smoke, uh, a gas charge and mm. fragments of metal all just ripping me to bits. And I just, I, I believe it's a miracle that they've managed to give me a second chance at life. So that's my main, I, I don't know, I just believe it's, it, there's a reason and there's a purpose for me to be here. Because if there wasn't, I, it would have took me, but it mm. didn't take me. So you have had suicidal thoughts. Yeah, I've you've... been I've been to the worst of suicide recently, mm. and because I keep, something keeps stopping me, mm. and I'm always forever grateful for all the surgeons who were involved saving my life at the Queen Elizabeth. And yeah. you're a walking miracle. Yeah, and obviously all the aftercare. Because of that, I just I feel like I have to do something mm. constructive with it instead of sitting at home not doing anything about it. I want to be like a bit of an inspiration to others out there yeah. who are in a crisis so I can to sort of basically can look at me. Because I had a comment of someone, someone put a comment on one of my uh, pictures or videos I've done with their, uh, on, online. And they said, um, I've been overweight and I've struggled with mental health for many years. Mm. But after reading your story and hearing what you've got, what you've been through, 
Um, it's made me realise to pull my socks up because, in a sense, obviously, if I, if I can go through this, then other people with no actual injuries on the outside but they're mentally unwell, they need to look at someone like me and think, hang on a minute, if he can go to the brink and come back and find light at the end of the tunnel, then why can't I? I read that you wanted to... You are thinking about whether you become a motivational speaker. Do you go to talk to kids in school who might yeah, be well, thinking about that's petty the thing. crime? I want to I wanna, kind of... I wanna make awareness of anyone who's doing this sort of thing, like scrapping business mm. and not aware of the dangers. I want to make them aware of the dangers and I want to educate them to nip it in the bud and never to do this because not many people get given a chance and I want them people in a struggle financially doing this sort of thing, mm. go to college, train yourself, get educated and get a good career behind yourself. I mean, how are you managing, though, in terms of... You know, we've talked a lot about the cost of living crisis, prices going up. How are you? Ma how are you managing, or do you? Do you need uh, more just help? about, just about managed. Yeah. I've got a bit of family and support yeah. about me, but it is difficult. It's a lot. Obviously, the money that I'm on at the moment with benefits and stuff, it's a hell of a lot of less than what I was earning working mm. by a quarter. Do you know what I mean? So obviously, it's difficult. But I've, I've, I've just have to manage with what I've got and live with what I've got. And find another, and also find a new career, if you like. You know, you've yeah, got to yeah. find a... Because I'm still relatively young, I'm 29, I'm 30 29. in October. So it'd be a shame for me to sit away and waste my life and just do nothing and then cause pain for other people and all sorts like that. I want to I wanna do something mm. constructive and be an inspiration to yeah. others. That's what yeah. I want to do. Because well, I've, you... I've still got my mind, like, even though yeah. the appearance has changed... You've got your body, though. You... Yeah, yeah, my heart's still beating. I'm still the same person as what I was before. And it, 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 I'm, it, I'm still Darren, do you know what I mean? Yeah. But obviously, yeah. I just look different. And is that hard, looking different? Yeah. Cos I, I think you look great. Thank you. You look really well. I do, considering what I've been through. But, but obviously, is that very hard to, when I look to, at, to look in the mirror? Yeah. Because you know what you did look like. Yeah, so obviously, in my eyes, what hurts the most is obviously the face that I was born with and the face that everybody knew me mm. as Darren has gone and it's never coming back. Mm. And there's, no matter what I do in the world, that face will never come back. So what people remember me what I, as is gone. And it's really disturbing to think of that as well. And it hasn't... Been, yeah, we yeah. About, it's not been very long. It's no, been 18, 18 months, months. So actually, to... so I, the, as I look now, this is the worst I'll ever look. Um, I've not had any reconstructive surgery yet. I've not had my microbladed eyebrows or my hair transplant. Or uh, the main thing I'm going for at the moment is bioprinting, bioprinting right. technology. So there's three ways of reconstructing an ear. Mm. You can have uh, magnetic clip-ons, uh, mm. like a silicone. Or you can have uh, rib reconstruction where they tamper mm. away at your ribs and rebuild the cartilage out the ear, out your ribs, sorry. But then you're relying on the surgeon's technique to sculpture the ear. But there's a third option, which just come out relatively new, uh, at Swansea University, and a few other companies in the world, like uh, Australia and China, are doing it. Mm. So basically, they take your stem cells from your body, um, they put some whatever material with it, and then they can 3D print Mm. The cartilage, it's a living ink. It's so they can, they can go on pictures of my old ear, the mm. dimensions of how it used to look. And they can, and they can read, they can 3D print that ear. So in time, I so should have. So have your, they reconstruct your ears. To how it used to look eyebrows. on a picture of my old face. What would you say uh, to young men, to people, to people struggling either with making ends meet, struggling with? How they look, how they feel about themselves, struggling with depression. What, what's your, what's your message? My message to anyone out there attempting this sort of thing is to don't even contemplate doing it mm. because one, it's not worth it. You can get into trouble and get in, in prison for it. Mm. Two, if you do do it and you, you could end up dead, or you could end up looking like me and having even more problems, because mm. even though I was in a financial struggle and I had my own issues going on before the accident, mm. since the accident, all my problems have multiplied by thousands. Mm. So I don't, I would, what I've been through, I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. Mm. I just wouldn't. And Darren Friday, when you look back on that day, just before you went into that yard, what would you, what would you say to yourself now? Do a U-turn and walk away. Mm. But I can't turn the clock back. 
Do you know what I mean? That is something, if you had a stopwatch to say stop, go back in time, I'd love to do that. Mm. But obviously, I can't physically do that. I can't change the matter of time. But... All I can do is the, the time that I've got left in my life and what the next journey, my next chapter in life, is to do better and do well from it. Well, I'm sure you will. And yeah. thank you so much for coming and telling us your story today. I really liked meeting you. I really enjoyed it. No thank worries. You. Thank you very much. Thank you.